last time we talked? Oh, okay. Um, what we did last time we talked was to talk about um, some of the challenges that are involved in merging black holes. And then we talked about some of the properties of star clusters around supermassive black holes. And we talked about different physical processes. We talked about the Hill mechanism. We talked about unbinding binaries. And we spent a lot of time talking about the eccentric Kozai-Lidov mechanism. This is roughly where we left off. And today we'll talk about some um, cool, more astrophysical stuff. We'll talk about disentangling different channels. And if we'll have time, we'll talk about collisions. I switched them. Um, and what we ended up with, we said that the eccentric cosi mechanism happens, take place when I have a three body system and we are torquing one of the orbits. We're actually torquing the two orbits, but one of them is being torqued more because of the angular momentum differences between them. And the one that it's being torqued more is the one with the smallest angular momentum. And it takes time over a secular time scale, which is longer than the orbital time scale. So it's much, much longer than that. And we talked about some developments that take place uh, in our understanding of how this system works. And here we showed an example of inclination, one niceness eccentricity. And this is semi major axis because we included gravitational wave emission as a function of time. And the blue one is previous calculations, and the red shows how ex high eccentricity, how, ex how much of high eccentricity we can reach. And even we can merge it because a gravitational wave emission will, uh, will work to, um, to take energy out of the orbit and circularize and, uh, and merge it. Now, there was a nice question in the, in the Slack that I want to um, I want to highlight. The question was, how long does it take? And that's a very good question. And the thing is that it's hard to tell because it depends on the system's parameters. It depends on the orbits. Roughly the time scale of this modulation, the lowest order of modulation, quadrupole, that takes place on time scale, which is proportional to the outer orbit um, period square over the inner inner uh, inner period, and there are factors of the eccentricity and there are factors of the mass. So all of these take into account. However, this entire system is chaotic. Therefore, we cannot predict every time of these modulations, these high modulations take place. We cannot really predict them. It's uh, it, the chaotic doesn't mean that it's not stable. It is stable, but it's chaotic, so we cannot predict the time scale very well. Uh, this is where statistics come into play. So here I'm showing you one example, but if we're doing a statistical an analysis of many systems such as this, um, in order to understand the rate and pr have predictions to LIGO rates, we need to um, we need to we need to do um, we need to have some assumptions or have some constraints or have some understandings on the number of binaries, because at the end of the day, the number of binaries that we have in the in a galactic center, this is what matters. Um, nothing else, actually, because the eccentric Kozai-Lido is very efficient. So no matter how I, uh, when I populate things, I have the, the possibility to populate them in different ways, and I can sample different parts of the parameter space. So at the end of the day, the thing that really matters about the rate is how many binaries I have to play with. And if I assume some assumptions like continuous star formation, motivate myself from things that we know in our galactic center, uh, Baumin, for example, showed that um, we can estimate something between one to 14, and this is per cube, uh, per, per volume per year. This is the black hole, black hole merger rate. Um, and again, we need the statistics because the system is chaotic. I'll be more than happy to talk about chaos more if someone is interested. Is something that I think is pretty cool. Now, when I I kind of ended my talk last time on this slide and um, with this example, and I said something. I said, you know, this is this is an, an exercise with only two black holes, but we talked about having this stellar evolution, and we need to overcome this uh, phase of common envelope, right? The phase where the 
two stars begin to eat each other. So we want to overcome it. So we want to make sure that this actually is taking place. So um, it is possible, and we've done it. Uh, other people also included stellar evolution to all this. So here I'm presenting a study that um, that includes eccentric Kozailidov, has general relativity, has tides, has post-main sequence stellar evolution for both single and binary stars. And it really matters, not only because this phase of eating each other, but also because as stars evolve, they lose mass. And as they lose mass because of angular momentum conservation, they expand. And as they expand, um, the configuration of the system changes. And I can re-trigger the eccentric Kozailido in places of the parameter space that were less favorable initially. So this is something that we found is very helpful. We also included in this system unbinding the binary, as I showed you before, from neighbors, and also the Hills mechanism. If the binary comes too close to the supermassive black hole, it breaks it apart. So disruption due to the supermassive black hole. And in general, it means that we can follow stars from birth to old age, all the way up to death. Um, and in general, what we found, we found many different systems so the death uh, icon, here it is. Um, we found many, many different systems. We found black holes, we found neutron stars, and we found white dwarfs as well. Um, and, <coughs> sorry. Binary system of, of black holes and uh, neutron star black holes and white dwarfs and a lot of catalytic variables. And I um, actually don't know, guys, if you see me very well. I got just a, like this message that says that my internet is unstable. So if they are choppy, just let me know. So um, and maybe I'll also start uh, the chat to see if there are any questions in the chat. Sorry. All right. So um, and I want to highlight, I want to really highlight here um, the work from an undergrad. Uh, Cheryl Wang, that included an updated stellar evolution of solar and also subsolar metallicities. So there are two points to take here, or maybe three. First point to take is that um, there was, remember that I showed you this recipe, the heuristic idea of the recipe with the two stars. I, I mentioned also that um, the, those, those recipes have been updated. So we included these updated recipes. Additionally, we think that subcellular metallicities are important because of the hierarchical nature of galaxy formation. We started with lower metallicity. So if you really want to get some feeling of how metallicity plays into a role and what's the population, we also need to include that. And the third takeaway message is that an undergrads can write awesome papers. <laughs> and this is Cheryl here. Um, and what um, and so combining Cheryl's work and Alexander's work, uh, we found black hole black hole uh, merger rate detectable by LIGO um, with this, and then also for neutron star black hole rates. And so I'm writing these numbers here, and I always find that the, they're kind of funny. It's a number. What do we need to compare it to something? A number by itself doesn't tell us anything. The only thing that we can take away really quickly is how like there's an order of magnitude uncertainty that comes uh, from the fact that we really don't know enough about, um, about the evolution of, of stars and star formation and evolution of galaxies. We don't know enough about that. And that is uh, being, it's hided or highlighted here in, the, in this wide range. If you look at the literature, there was this nice paper recently by um, Leah Mandel and Floor, and I'm gonna mispronounce her last name, so I won't say it. But um, that I think someone put this uh, on Slack as well, and you can see the large error bars that people have on the rate. And I think it's uh, it's an interesting takeaway that while a lot of the community has all kind of interesting ideas and really cool ideas about how we can form different mergers and different compact objects to merge. We really lacking the understanding of some of the astrophysical processes that leads us to it. 
So what I'm going to do now is going to sound like a contradiction of my last sentence. What I'm going to do is I'm going to count those rates, even though we, uh, I just claim that we don't know a lot about them. And the reason that I'm going to do it is because I want to compare to something. I think just having a rate doesn't tell me anything. And there's another reason that I'm going to do it because I want to put things into context of where I can find, heuristically at least, um, formation and um, of merger of merger events. So to keep in mind, LIGO rate estimation of black hole black hole mergers is between 10 to 100 gigaparsec uh, cube per gigaparsec cube per year. Now, if we want to see what are the different ideas that there are in the literature, and I think you also heard about some others as well. So I mentioned these um, that are between one to 20. And this is really just inside of just a very tiny portion of a galactic, uh, galactic nuclei. Um, and this is also, a, it seems like a lower limit if you start to include the hard binaries, right? Because we only included the wide binaries. So if we include the hard binaries, this number increases. If you include, include triples, this number increases. So, and then again, within the uncertainties of how many hard binaries are there, how many triples are there inside this, right? So this is now quadruple, quadruple system. If instead of binary here, I talk about triples. If I include collisions, then this is one of the nice estimates that there are. And then I can go further, right? Because this, as I said, a very tiny place. If I go further apart, further away to inside a few parsecs, and I take into account the fact that often galaxies have some sort of a bar, so there are some asymmetries uh, in the system, so it's not a symmetric system anymore. The, um, the underlining potential create a, uh, create a dynamical behavior, which is very similar to the eccentric causalidum. Um, it takes over longer time scales, and, um, um, and the densities are somewhat lower. And at the end, you get, again, within all the uncertainties, I should say that the uncertainties in this calculation and in this calculation are very similar to one another. So with these, uh, these uncertainties, you get this, um, this range of numbers. And then you can go further out to globular clusters, which is, as I mentioned, uh, very popular with a lot of uh, people working on it. And that can explain a big chunk of, um, of rates or even maybe all of it. That's an interesting thing. And then, you know, you can do a funny exercise and add all of this. And um, I will quote one of my mentors, Fred Rassio, who always say, if you add up orders of magnitude numbers, you will get an order of magnitude number which is what we did here, right? So this is a silly exercise to do. And the reason that it's silly is because there's no meaning to do that. The only meaning is to see in context and to see that dynamical processes here can explain, right? If you believe the silly exercise can explain a big bunch of LIGO, uh, LIGO rate. But of course, we don't know if all of them happening at the same time, or maybe it's all just the slower uh, lower rate, lower range here, or maybe these lower range by themselves are or will be um, very optimistic. I should say that this is a very narrow view of the proposed ideas. There's also ideas about uh, merging binaries in AGN disks, which I'm not talking about. And of course, isolated binaries um, can explain also the entire rate of um, of, of LIGO as well. And this is again after they after there was an update on the um, on the uh, on the estimation. And then of course triples in the field is also something that a lot of people consider as well. So overall I should say that there are a lot of cool ideas that are there in the literature. And again, this is also not highlighting everything. So I'm sorry if your favorite mechanism is not there. Um, but this is not, this doesn't tell us anything apart from this is fun to do and it's kind of cool, but what else? What's the next step, right? The community likes to come with lots of cool ideas, but our job as theorists is to disentangle them, right? If I come up with some idea, I need to say, I need to come with tests and predictions 
that later can be tested and used in observations to see, did I forget part of the physics? Did I had the funny assumptions? Uh, what's up with, you know, if you add all the rest, you'll get with rates that are even larger than these rates, right? If you add everything else, so it's, a, it's kind of funny. So what, what's happening here? So I think this is where um, a lot of the fun and interesting things really take place in trying to disentangle. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time and highlight, it's really a cherry pick type of a, um, of a thing to try to disentangle between the different, um, the different ideas. Oh, and I also wanna remind everyone, please interrupt me as much as you want. Um, I, I would love to hear questions or thoughts or discussion. This is funner if it's a discussion and, a, um, and question oriented than me just talking in my room. All right, so I, I think she should be able to hear you now with the microphone. Is it okay? Stop the story. Yeah. Hi, Sudar. I think there's yeah. a question here. If you can hear. Hi, Sudar. Hey. Oh, this is great. Thank you for, for putting all this together. I'm curious, on your last slide, you've got all these mechanisms, and they've all got, you know, if you look at the low end of the uncertainty, there's all, they all have some finite number. Right, one per cubic gigaparsec per year, 1.5, or you know, whatever's on the low end. So my question is, is it possible? Are those lower numbers like hard? Are they strong limits, or is it possible that some of these the rates go down to zero or down to another order of magnitude? Right? Are there assumptions that are being made that are maybe wrong, where some of these don't happen at all, or should we expect that all of these things are happening at some level? That's an excellent question. I, I, I kind of hinted to that, that these lower numbers, maybe they're zeros, right? Because I think that there's so much that we don't know. And there's, there's so much that we don't really understand about, and about the basics of star formation. And all of this really relies really heavily on star formation. And I would say here I'm highlighting, um, I'm highlighting all the dynamical channels because I'm familiar with them. I would also have the same uh, the same thoughts on the um, on the stellar evolution channels, and I would say that there's isolated uh, binary stellar evolution channels because I would say that even in them, not only that we don't know about this, the the um, star formation rate, which you know both of these channels rely heavily upon, we also don't understand very well the way and the process of star evolves. We know very heuristically. At least in some sense here, we know how gravity works. That's, that's some sort of a comfort. Maybe it's a, not a, a great comfort, but it's some sort of a comfort. So I completely agree with you. It can be that this is completely zero, or this is completely the upper limit, or even maybe the upper limits are too, too pessimistic. I think it describes how little we understand. Um, and this is where I think that we really need to go and try to um, to come up with predictions to disentangle this this web instead of um, of continue to generate rates. And it's fun to generate rates, and you want to do that because you want to show that your mechanism is you know up to competition is competitive with some other things. But it doesn't mean that um, that it's enough, right? So there's the politics of how to publish papers versus how, how science should be made. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sure. There's another question in the Zoom, I see, by Aman. Hi, hi, Smar. Uh, I just had a clarification to ask. So uh, when you say dist entangle these numbers, uh, basically they aren't exclusive, right? So you'll be looking for uh, things exclusive in these regions and that is what you mean by entangling right i i say i i try to take even a, a, a even one more step back and to say maybe we shouldn't pay too much attention to these rates as a number and take them on face value maybe instead of it we should try to figure out what signatures these type of uh, mechanisms, right? Because I'm describing really distinct different mechanisms. So what signatures these mechanisms can leave in observational regime or in the detectable regime? And then 
we can give predictions to these signatures and try to go and figure it out. So I, I think that the rates themselves carry with them too many uncertainties that we don't understand. Okay. Okay. So Does that so answer your question? So, so you'll be looking at like totally different processes uh, in itself to in disentangle. So I'm going to, to look at these processes and ask what type of signatures they're going to leave in the gravitational wave signal. Mm -hmm. So this is what I have to do. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Sure, my pleasure. Um, are there other questions? Yes, I have one, Smana. Um, I, I have a question about your stellar systems that in the end lead to a merger. Um, mm -hmm. Are there, you know, this term useful triples in the sense that uh, they wouldn't have merged if there was no tertiary companion? Or do you also count in those systems that anyway merge? Oh, that's a very good, that's a very good question. Um, I have, um, let's see how easy it will be for me to show the plot. Uh, this plot, oh, I cannot, let me move this. Um, so this plot show the fraction of systems as a function of time. Um, and here I'm showing stellar, the how many binaries I have in blue. And then I'm showing here how many things merged in general from the beginning of the simulation all the way to the end, which is 10 to the 10 years. And in uh, green, this is how many uh, systems have uh, become unbound because of interactions with other neighbors. I'm also taking into account here the Hill process, but there are not a lot of them um, from the way that we constructed it. So it's not, it wasn't meaningful. Um, and what you see here that, first of all, there are several systems that merged and they merged already in the, um, um, in before basically the, um, they became two black holes. They merged during the main sequence uh, time. And these we think are related to something else it's pretty cool we see in the galactic center, but beyond the topic of, of this summer school. Here is where you're interested in where your question comes into life. So in this part of the, of the parameter space, we have systems that merge um, and they merge due to a combination of both COSI and stellar evolution. Most of our systems are pretty wide because we, we start them wide. Uh, we start beyond the hard limit. And um, some of them merge immediately, and those are just on the onset of stellar evolution. So these things are those that will merge even if they were without cosine, because they're too close, they start to evolve, and you can see that immediately they merge. These systems here, they really need cosine. I had another plot, but I don't have it here with me, but there, it's in Alexander's paper. So these things really need cosine. So the bulk of them, really do need cosine, but they do count those that will merge in ways. Okay. Did that answer just, your question? Just to clarify, those uh, didn't underwent a common envelope evolution. Those that, those that yeah. need the cosine mechanism, they didn't undergo any common envelope evolution. Yeah, yeah, sorry, that's true. Yeah, they, they, they didn't, they didn't. So they, we count them there here and merged after, <laughs> after they became a compact object. Sorry, I wasn't clear. So these ones here went through an economic envelope evolution and these ones here did not. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, or maybe one quick follow-up question. About <laughs> you, you briefly talked about these stellar collisions. Uh, do you expect uh, a collision remnant out of that or is this? Is this yes. Yeah, I, I, give, I give a whole talk about this. Yes, I, I do. I, we call these, we see them in the galactic center. They call them G2 life objects because the first one was G2. It was a gas cloud that seemed like it's going to fall and be eaten by the supermassive black hole, but then the thing didn't, um, didn't get eaten by the supermassive black hole. It looks like a gas cloud, but it was not. Um, but you can calculate what will be the mass of something that will pass so close, like 100 AU from the supermassive black hole and will not get eaten. And the mass of something like this should be about something like the order of a few solar mass. But this thing doesn't look like a star, it looks like a gas. So we're thinking that this is, a, um, this is just a, two stars that merged due to this and you know, undergo very messy, very messy behavior of uh, 
of a star that two stars that merge. And the prediction is that there'll be way more. And we there's a very nice paper recently that showed that there are more. And then you can ask, okay, what happened after this messy thing takes place? Then it's like a it's like the ultimate facelift because I rejuvenate the stars, the, 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 the star merger. Now it's look younger. And so we propose that maybe it explains those young stars in the galactic center. It's like a blue struggler, basically. Okay, cool. Does that Thank answer your question? Yes, very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, other questions? All right. So let's talk about spins and ways to disentangle, right? We're trying to disentangle this web of ideas on how to get um, and how to get at the end of the day some understanding of um, of these different processes. So I'll start by discussing spin. Um, and here I'm plotting right where I have this is a cartoon of a of a system. This is its angular momentum, and this is the spin. And what LIGO measure, measures, it's called psi effective. This is actually the projected uh, angular momentum on the combination of, of, the, um, of the spins. And it's also uh, normalized by the mass. And the clear takeaway here is that I can have a small psi effective by either having slow rotations of the black holes, right? S1 and S2 are small. Or you will have spin orbit misalignment that L in is really misaligned with S. Now there are interesting ideas, right? Before LIGO made some detections of spins, um, when you when you look to see in the literature or you ask people about what they think that the that the birth spin of a black hole is, most ideas came that it should be very high. And the reason is because when you look at high mass X-ray binaries, um, the estimations of these uh, of these black holes is that they spin really really fast. So there was an expectation that black holes born fast rotating with a large spin. Um, then LIGO observed a small um, small psi, which also is a clear result of eccentric Kozai-Lidov, if one wants to think about this, uh, because the eccentric Kozai-Lidov leads to large misalignments. It's actually very similar to the way that uh, people use, people also me, use to try to explain misalignments in exoplanets. So it's the same physics as well, right? And this is what LIGO observes, this is psi effective. However, there are lots of ideas now that maybe um, the way that black holes are born is actually with slow rotating. And that relates to the changes that were made to the understanding of uh, post-main sequence stellar evolution. So it's a question I think that is still unanswered. So while it seems on face value that um, slow, that the detections of low psi effective should immediately call for any type of dynamical channel, not just TKL. Um, it seems that the jury is still out. So that seems promising, but it's not enough. So let's continue to search um, an understanding. So maybe we need to move beyond LIGO. One of the things that seems very promising is to see something with Lisa. So I'll go back to Cheryl's work again. And um, for example, Cheryl, um, Cheryl predicts that we, can, we are able to detect just pure black hole, black holes. These are small black holes in LISA. So LISA is going to be a space, um, a space uh, uh, detector. Just for comparison, if LIGO is about four kilometers, LISA is 2.5 million kilometers, 2.5 million kilometers. It's going to be in space. So it's be able to, and um, because it's going to be so large, it's going to observe with lower frequencies. And here I'm plotting the characteristic strain that tells me by how much the arm will change due to the, uh, the arm of Lisa will change due to the, due to the waves. And here, um, uh, Cheryl just plotted the, um, the envelope of, um, of, the, um, of the gravitational wave signal. And you can see that many of them can be detected above Lisa, um, Lisa uh, sensitivity curve, which is here in red. You can see it here. 
So that seems interesting. She expects, and this is again, numbers are funny, but given the uncertainties that I quoted before about 10 black holes and maybe even a hundred white dwarfs and white dwarfs can be detected with LISA, not with LIGO, but with LISA, which is pretty interesting. So LISA might be a good source to try to find, this is by the way, 10 only in our galactic center. So we should have 10 or a few in every galactic nuclei, maybe um, detectable by LISA. Uh, so, so LISA might be a good source of um, possibility to try to disentangle. Is there a question? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I was wondering if this, uh... The, the strain, the it's very smooth how is how it ends, how the characteristic strain it grows and then it very smoothly sort of turns down. And I was wondering, yeah, if, yeah for example, on the right towards the right side, it sort of slowly becomes less and less. Wait, you mean here in this side or in this side? We're <laughs> talking about the peaks for an, an individual track. Exactly. So an individual track from low frequency to high frequency, it grows as I would expect, and then it yeah. uh, goes down, which I, I have never seen tracks that sort of smoothly go down. Maybe maybe it's the something is going on here. So there are two things. First of all, this goes down because you have a peak in the eccentricity, and then and then you don't get the harmonics anymore, but you cover this entire part over here. And this is the envelope, right? So what it actually does, it's, it, it goes back up and down, up and down, up and down quite a bit, right? And we're just plotting the envelope because otherwise it just, it's just meaningless. It's too much, it's too, uh, it's too loud to see anything. So we're plotting the envelope of this, uh, of this whole jugged behavior. Um, there is an interesting thing here that you can see and it comes because uh, of the frequency relationship with the uh, period frequency. Of the um, of the system, and this one is this behavior is pretty much consistent with uh, with seeing an eccentric. This is an eccentric system, right? This is uh, this is an eccentric system uh, in a in Lisa band. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sure. So I think we can establish that Lisa can be promising. So let's see what Lisa can can do right now. Right, if I'll say, all right, I'll see a black hole or a white dwarf, um, how do I know where it's coming from, right? Who, who told me where it's coming from? So let's try to figure this out. Um, so one thing, if I have a binary going around really, really close to supermassive black hole, I have a possibility maybe um, to see differences as it moves around. In fact, I'll have a redshift as it goes away from me and blue shift as it coming toward me. So that might be uh, pretty promising to observe. Another thing that can take place in this type of system is that as it moves around, it will undergo cosi because that's what's happened. And what cosi does is changing the eccentricity. And this is one of the hallmark things that cosi will do. So, what I'm going to show you is that it leaves a very clear signature on, um, on the Lisa band. So here I'm showing the characteristic strain as a function of the frequency. This is Lisa sensitivity curve. And we're going to observe a system that its eccentricity is changing due to cosines such as that. And we're going to um, chop it to intervals of one month. So imagine Lisa is like a bucket of instead of light, right? Telescopes is a bucket of light. This is a bucket of gravitational waves. And as I'm collecting these gravitational waves, I can go and do post-processing and figure out what, what was happening. So after, let's say a year, I can look and have different window functions of these different time slots. And here, for example, we propose a, a month and we had a methodology on how to do this. Um, and what you will see is something like this. You will see the signal coming back and forth. And um, I don't know if you can actually see the movie. Yeah, I see. I think you see the movie. So the back and forth in the, in the Lisa band. And this is what will happen. And 
this is a nice and clear signature that can only take place if I have a tertiary there, right? It doesn't have to be a supermassive black hole. It can be whatever tertiary that there will be. It also doesn't have to be a uh, black hole's binary. It can also be a black hole neutron star or um, more likely white dwarf, white dwarf binary will also have a similar behavior. Only you will see different, um, you will have different curves because um, just because of the, of the signal that will come from them. And you can estimate, right? So this is um, this is the plot from the movie that I showed you. This is if the oscillations um, are much uh, are much longer than the observational time scale. But you can say so. This observational is the chopping of the of, of one month. But you can say what if it's kind of similar to one another? Then in this case, what we can do? I will have two characteristic scales that are very similar to one another and they're not, they do not look dissimilar so much. But in order to get a, a significant statistical result, what I can do is really um, subtract the two characteristic strains. And that can give a very nice uh, result. So then this way we can actually get a signature even when the oscillations are not in our favor, so to speak. Um, so it is seem very promising because the eccentric quasi-elido will always change the eccentricity. We do need it to change the eccentricity in a specific part of the parameter space. So here, for example, it will come and go, right? It will come. And then in this specific case, it will go and will never come back because Lisa maybe will work for 10 years and then it will die. And this is about, well, sorry, this might, be, might come back just before Lisa will die. <laughs> Um, but in the other case, it may not come back because this time, so it will just do once and then it will stop. Um, so we can also map the parameter space and ask where I can find it. So if I will see some oscillations, I know that it's in this part of parameter space. If I see just decay, it will be in this part of the parameter space. And here I'm showing one minus E is a function of same major axis. I have a bunch of parts that are not detectable, both due to the system of the, um, uh, the system itself. Um, oh, here I'm highlighting the different parts of the parameter space. It's both due to the fact that I need to have the oscillations in a specific part of the parameter space and so on. <laughs> um, and this is for different places. So this is for assuming a black hole binary in our own galactic center which as I mentioned, we're, it seems promising that there might be black hole binary in our, in, in our own galactic center that we might be able to detect the B sign. That will be extremely loud because it's so close. This is, what will this is how it will happen. It will just go one megaparsec away. Um, I wanna suggest one more, um, I wanna highlight one more possibility to disentangle the parameter space. And for that, I will need a little bit uh, um, to explain a little bit of background. So I want to pause for a second to see if there are any questions about what I've uh, what I've shown now. So, so I, I have one question. Do these, yeah. do these eccentric and Doppler shifted orbits, do, is there a challenge in modeling the waveform to be able to find these things? So, um, I think I think that the eccentric not so much. I think that there are other things that may come into play that will be harder. So on face value, you can say, hold on, what about the inclination? The inclination should also change. And when the inclination changes, um, remember also Lisa changing. So we are so it's orbiting. So the inclination of us with respect to a tertiary or not a tertiary to a triple is also changing. Therefore, it means that I need somehow to, there is a um, difference in the amplitude that comes because of the inclination. I can correct for that of Lisa, but um, the one that, and then I basically can tease out the one that will come from, uh, from a triple, but that is another complication on trying to understand the waveform. However, Luckily, when the eccentricity is so high that it will be detectable in LISA, the inclination changes are very meaningless, or not meaningless, but not very significant. 
So in that case, I would say that the inclinations are okay. There's another thing that changes, which is the argument of periaps that tells me where the ellipse points at. That is um, seem to be a whole can of worms, um, which this is why we haven't addressed it yet. Um, the reason is because where the where the system points toward us will change, um, will modify the how we how we model the waveform, and. Um, and you can, and we can estimate some stuff from the eccentric causal dog that has some constraints on how omega behaves. But then in general, omega can either circulate or can either um, uh, um, rotate. And therefore, what we will get is that um, it's it's a mess. And this is also omega in the plane of the of the ellipse, and we need to project it to the sky. And the sky, the, or not just the sky, the where the plane of Lisa and Lisa again is changing, so it's um it's a it's a nightmare of projections. It's not I think too horrible, but it's a question whether or not it it messes up the signal too much. I don't think so much, just because um, because the eccentric cosinus will give you some constraints on what the omega can be, so that that is okay. Um, so overall, that will be fine. And I think one of the interesting things is that using a combination of how much the inclination changes, how much the eccentricity changes, how much the um, little omega, so the argument of periaps changes, and the Doppler, all of you is together can tell you quite a lot about where this binary is. Because Doppler, you will get really just close to a supermassive black hole, uh, an effective, meaningful Doppler, because the, the, the change there will be so fast. Just near a different uh, tertiary rate will be less effective. So that gives you a very nice signal of a supermassive black hole. Um, the changes of the, um, of the eccentricity and inclination, they will immediately tell you that there is another friend present. And from this type of changes, you can put some constraints uh, from the time scales of these changes. You can put constraints on, um, on basically the cosi time scale that will be degenerate of the period of the outer orbit and the mass of the outer orbit and its eccentricity. Um, but then, when you start uh, when you start disentangling between the inclination and omega, you can start to disentangle the other parts. But the waveform. Um, it's not that bad. We know how to do it. I yeah. went actually in some tangent <laughs> answer. I don't know. Did I answer your question? You did. If I can make a comment, I happen to be sitting in a room full of very bright graduate students. And it, it sounds to me like I'm not, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I got the count, but it sounds to me like you described a system that instead of having like 15 or 16 parameters has maybe more like 20 or 22. And it occurs to me that um, in terms of working out the mechanics of how to actually dig this signal out, there might be uh, a lot to do there. So this is why I think that the eccentricity is in some ways the most promising because everything else, what it will do in my, um, in my in very heuristic way is to make a little bit of a band around each of these signals. So the signal will be, if you'll think about this just envelope, so the envelope itself um, will not be so sharp, which is something that we expect anyways. However, there's only one thing that can make a system goes in and out of a, of a band. And this is something that is detectable no matter what. So even if you don't know exactly the parameters, right? If you did your uh, analysis and you're still not sure about what the parameters of the binary is, if you see a signal coming and going inside, there's only one explanation to it. Um, well, unless until someone will come up with a different explanation, but this is the only explanation that I can think of so far. Um, so even though it seems a priori that I'm adding more parameters, I think they, um, and I think that I'm not because you can disentangle this pretty well. And, and the lovely thing is with Lisa, because there is such a nice bucket of um, of um, of gravitational wave emission, you can search with a with a with a window on a signal to try to tease out this coming and going instead of throwing it out as a 
as a misfire. That makes sense? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and I would say one more thing. I mean, I think that no matter what, we cannot, I don't think that we can ignore the dynamical channels. So even if everything at the end of the day seems very grim that we need to have you know, our masks back on because the Delta variant is bad, the Delta is there. So it's, you know, even if at the end of the day, it seems so grim that there, we need to deal with 20 parameters, I think that we can, well, my analogy was really bad. <laughs> maybe maybe you misunderstood. My point was that many of these students might be looking for projects, and it sounds to me oh. like you good projects in here. That was oh, my yeah. conversation. Sorry, yeah, I, I I interpreted too pessimistic. Sorry, I just saw the news before, and things are so great. So <laughs> uh, we had another question from Roy. Sure. Um, so my question is uh, related to these oscillations if they are kind of chaotic or how sensitive are the, on the initial conditions. Because I'm wondering that if we want to search for such signals, uh, like a small perturbation in the parameters will lead to a big change in the system. And this will be basically a nightmare for people actually looking for these signals. Even if you see them appearing and disappearing, you need to accumulate enough SNR and follow on the trajectory and eccentricity on all the parameters. So it's an excellent question. And, uh, and the first step that we did as a proof of concept is try to explain it from this po point of view. So here, this is the eccentricity is one minus E of the, of the binary, and this is the three major axis. We have not changed other parameters because this was a very proof of concept paper. So we have not changed the distance from the supermassive black hole. We did not play with that. And we did not play with its eccentricity, uh, uh, the outer orbit eccentricity. But we did play with the parameters of the binary. And for the parameters of the binary, everything that is here is cosi driven. So then it's not very sensitive, everything that is here. Here, gravitational wave emission will tend to shrink the binary. And what you will see is something that has a very clear directionality to it. So you know that the binary is shrinking and soon will disappear because it will appear after a few years in LIGO. Um, and here, this is the, the SNR is too small, so we will not see it. And this is completely not detectable. Uh, so to answer your question, not very much in this part of the parameter space. So this is for a specific system around the supermassive black hole, which I'm blanking out on the exact parameters of it. Um, but there is a lot of more work to do here to try to understand exactly what is the um, what is the dependencies of the distribution of the binary black holes around the supermassive black hole binary, which is yet another unknown that we don't we don't even know how to address it. Yes. Apart from you know we know how to imagine how to do it, but we don't know how to constrain it. That will be a better uh, thing. Did I answer your question? Was that your question about? Thanks. Okay, I have a, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you dealing with a rotating supermassive black hole? Oh, excellent. Another excellent question. No. And a rotating supermassive black hole will have another effect um, because it can, um, it can drag the system with this. With it, you need to be um, somewhat close to being in the time scale that will be interesting, although there are some other papers that are uh, claiming that it can even take place for uh, for binary that will be further apart. So it's interesting. Um, but then you will get another signal on top of it. It will not be in and out, but you will have a different signal on the um, on the on the on the system. But here no, we did not deal with a rotating supermassive black hole. And how much more difficult do you think that it would be for modeling? This is a rotating black hole. Or how much more fun for a graduate student? <laughs> I think that's extremely fun. And if you're interested, I'll be more than happy to help with it. Thank you. Send me an email. Um, yeah, I right. can I ask one more question? One question? Yeah, yeah, the, the more the merrier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what changes are it gonna bring to the data analysis part? Uh, from the LIGO, like when we uh, when we have more number of sources, 
uh, seeing at a similar time, like more signal superimposed. Can we separate it? Is it possible? Let me see if I understood your question. You're asking me, um, giving these, um, I'm trying to disentangle different parts of the parameter space. Let's say that you have, are you going to use that to update the, the rates? Is that your question? Like apart from the increasing, uh, apart, apart from the number of parameters, what, what changes are it gonna bring to the data analysis part? To the data analysis of LIGO or of LISA? LISA, LISA. Lisa, is it so um, like uh, LIGO? Is it what? Sorry. Is it is it is com is it completely different from LIGO? Or? Um, so the it is different because the um, the system the system is different, but it's not different so much that so for example in this paper we collaborated with the LIGO with a LIGO person to help with the Lisa part. So it's uh, close enough that it's uh, that it's uh, um, possible to try to understand the, the, the different ways. You just need to take into account the, um, the parameters of the system itself. And I should say that Lisa by itself is still under contra construction. It's, you know, it's not, I, sometimes I, I joke and I say that Lisa uh, launch time is, co-moving with us, because if you look at papers today from 95, they say Lisa is going to launch in 10 years. So it seems a bit, but if it will launch at one point, I think that understanding exactly what will be the limitations from the, um, from the point of view or just uh, understanding what the, the instrument itself is doing and what its noise level, this is one thing that is, I mean, I think this is a very interesting data analysis problem by itself. And what we are doing here, we're being very um, theor with our theoreticians hat and very less with any data analysis hat. We give predictions by assuming that the data will be perfect, um, right? This is what usually the theorist's game is. Um, but the data might not be perfect and there might be lots of limitations. But once we really know exactly what we're dealing with, I think this is where it's good to start playing that game, if that makes sense. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Was that your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, so Dan, I'll do what you suggest. Should I stop here or should I move to the next possibility? Because it will take me, like I would say, between five to ten minutes, depending how much I have. I'd be happy to hear the, the next part. What about everyone else? <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So the next. Oh, there's another question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, if it's okay, if we don't have. Yeah, to... yeah, yeah. Go ahead. It's it's fun. It's really fun. This is the point, right? Um. I'm having a hard time uh, trying to understand how to detect this oscillation in the characteristic strain uh, because how I understand it, the characteristic strain is sort of the track of the whole evolution of a binary and observing for only one month, I, I would in, intuitively, I would say that you would observe a little, a little section of the characteristic strain instead of observing a, another characteristic strain that is in another place, if you see my point. And also, I don't understand how these oscillations that are sourced by the cosi lead of mechanism can occur on timescales of a month, because uh, I would say the cosi generally, it would take much longer to change the eccentricity, but yeah, but the first part is sort of what is troubling or what I don't understand. If you see, All right. let me let me explain. So I think that usually when people think about Lisa, they think about extreme mass ratio in spirals. And in extreme mass ratio in spirals, the way that people have modeled the characteristic strain there is usually the evolution until it merges, and yeah. that appears here. That is correct. However, when you have a system such as this system, right? So here I'm showing frequency as a function of time. This, during this ev evolution, let's say that I didn't have any evolution. I just had a binary sitting somewhere with some eccentricity. It would have appeared just as Cheryl predicted it. 
it would have appeared like this, right? So these are many, many different systems. This is just a binary that doesn't change its eccentricity as a function of time. So it can be detected, and I don't actually need such a long, long uh, time scale to accumulate enough, um, enough data um, uh, signal to noise to see it. It depends on the parameters of the binary, but in this case, for example, um, she just accumulated stuff over one year, not even five years. I think this is even a, I, I think she had a, in the paper, she had a better, I'm not a better, an updated version of the four years. And this is an old version that I have of one year. So there's no, there is really no need to look at the evolution until it merged. You will not see black hole binary, stellar mass black hole binary merge in the LISA band. You will see it merge in the LIGO band. But you will just see it orbiting like this. So in that case, there is no problem. The other question that you had about these oscillations that take place so quickly, this is also not a problem. Because the quasi time scale, there are two things that I can say about it. Um, one thing is that it can have it. It is just depending on the outer orbit period over the square over the inner. But more than that, these oscillations take place even when I'm not in the purely hierarchical regime. That's the beauty of quasi. That I can have quasi time scale, which is normally shorter than the outer orbit evolution. What it will do is that over a long time scale, it will ignite even larger eccentricity excitations, which are not being captured well in the uh, eccentric quasi treatment that I described in the in my lecture on on Tuesday. However, um, the same behavior does happen. I have oscillations of eccentricity. So what do I care if I, I mean, if my secular treatment is not good enough, it's not good enough, but I know exactly what the physics will do. I can do this in embody, it doesn't matter. But this is what it will happen. It will have oscillations on the on time scale, which is quasi time scale roughly, because this is the shortest one, even if I have, um, even if I'll get to higher values than what I predict. I can have even smaller modulations of eccentricity on top of these modulations. So I'll, I'll stop the, I'll, I'll look at here, for example. If these are eccentricity modulations here, if you see my cursor, on top of it, I can sometimes have, think this is deviating from the hierarchical. I will have shorter eccentricity oscillations that take place on the orbital time scale itself. That happens because of, um, of violations from the orbital. Uh, from the hierarchical nature, but again, it doesn't it doesn't kill the behavior itself. So that is also not a problem. So both of these together just help us. This be this description that I did here is extremely conservative, and very assuming a lot of um, that the hierarchy is uh, is capable to take place. So if you actually relax the need for hierarchy, we did this just because it's then easier to calculate everything self consistently. But if you relax things, you, you get even larger part of the, the parameter space that is uh, ripe for this type of behavior. Did that answer to of, did both of your questions? I had one yeah. on the first part. Yes. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, Lawrence, you're thinking of a circular binary at one point in time makes one point on that plot because it's a Meaning at one frequency, and as it evolves, that frequency changes and it makes a line. Are these the space. harmonic? And this is an envelope of all the harmonics. Oh, oh okay, I see. Yeah, so yeah. I just... yeah, it does a lot of little things like this. Okay, yeah, so it's sort of a lot of little points, more like an evolutionary track. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, okay, this makes much more sense now. I was very confused <laughs> about this binary going back and forth in, uh, <laughs> in frequency. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sure. Um, so tell me what should I do? Should I stop here or should I continue? Uh, we should stop within five to ten minutes maximum. I, I believe to keep on some semblance of a schedule today. <laughs> okay. So I'll do I'll do it in five, and okay. I'll answer questions if there are. Um, so the other way that I want to propose is to look at a uh, map of the sky and anisotropies of the gravitational wave, um, gravitational wave signals. And for this, I need to um, 
where not my dynamicist hat, but my cosmologist hat. So if you remember, I said that I also work on this birth structure of the universe. And I wanna describe just a very simple, very quickly, so my eyes and the frog, um, how we imagine that structure is forming in our universe. We start at the time of recombination with some fluctuations, some over densities of the dark matter, which I illustrate here in black. And then the variance, the gas that we're all made of, it's smoother. And the reason that it's smoother is because before recombination, so recombination is the time where um, protons and electrons combine together to form a hydrogen. And this is since then the universe is transparent. Before that, when the universe is really a soup of matter and radiation, the, the variance, they couldn't grow. Their over densities from the time of inflation couldn't grow because they were radiative dominated. If they move a little bit, all the photons will come and bring them back. But the dark matter couldn't care less. It could grow. And it could grow linearly with, um, with a scale factor since the time of equality, which is the time where the energy density of the gas was equal, of the matter was equal to the energy density of the radiation. So at the time of recombination, which is what I'm saying here initially, there was this huge difference. In fact, it's five orders of magnitude difference in the amplitude. And then as time goes by, it grew because of gravity and grew some more. And we call this a galaxy, which is basically a dark matter and inside there is a gas. But there is something here that I alluded to. This difference, these five orders of magnitude, it says that in this time, there is actually a relative velocity between the dark matter and the gas. And you can think about it this way. If I sit in the frame of reference of the dark matter, I, I accumulated some peculiar velocity because I'm falling into my own dark matter potential well. And I see the, the baryons swooshing by because they were coupled to, they are coupled to the photons. So their velocity is close to the speed of light almost, um, up to some factors of square root of three. But then at the time of recombination, suddenly they, they can just go and I can see them, right? But they still have large velocities. And when you calculate what's the difference between these two velocities, you get 30 kilometers per second, um, and which is actually Mach 5. So it was supersonic. And this was detected or, or found first, not detected, found first by Tsarikovich and Hirata but in 2010. And then the question is, what does it do on structure formation? And we show that because you have, because you have speed, you have some time. So speed times time is, um, is a scale. And if you do include this, we call the stream velocity, you get that there is an offset between the over densities of the dark matter and the over densities of the gas. And these offset remains, it doesn't disappear. So even though it started small, when it grows, I have some part that is growing and becoming nonlinear away from the dark matter over density. And not only that it's um, away, it's not that it's by itself and it doesn't know that the dark matter is there. It's in a constant stream of falling, but missing a dark matter halo. And we showed that you can get some sort of, um, of um, over density of, of gas, which is basically um, nonlinear and can stand by itself and can grow and become something. And the mass scale and the scale of this are agree with global clusters. So um, we thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And then we also found them in simulations. So um, two different students, Christina Popa and your uh, and your Cho, uh, found this in simulation. So um, these were high resolution simulations that really found these gas only systems that seemed like progenitors of global clusters. And when we evolved them as a function of time to our present day, they seem to be agree to agree with the scale and with the uh, visual magnitude of global clusters. So maybe these things are uh, global clusters progenitors and that it's a whole new way to form global clusters. 
And as I told you, and as others in the school probably told you as well, um, global cluster seems to be a very interesting place to find black hole, black hole mergers. But this, this what I've just described to you has a very interesting signatures on the sky. And the signature is that across 100 megaparsecs, so if I look here on the sky and down here on the sky, if you see my two hands, I will see completely different values of this uh, relative velocity, because this relative velocity is a Gaussian distribution value. That means that if I can live here where we are, we may live in a patch of the universe, and this is what we predict, that has a high value of this string velocity, maybe a one sigma value or two sigma value, and maybe somewhere else it's a zero sigma value. And that signature can be found, and this is what we predict. So our prediction is that um, given, given the fact that global clusters may have lots of um, uh, black hole, black hole mergers, we will have a very clear anisotropy on a scale of about 10 degrees. I should say that right now on the larger scale, which is um, the three directions of the sky, here, here, and here, LIGO couldn't find anything, but this is, you know, we're talking about 100 degrees compared to smaller scales. This is, may not be observed now, but it's possible to be observed. Um, so that was, I think I did it in five minutes. That was really fast, collapsing something that sometimes I give a whole talk on. But I'm very excited about this because, again, there's no magic here. This is just physics. And it seems that the separation between gas and dark matter has to happen at the early universe. And these gas dominated uh, systems, which we call SIGOs, supersonically induced gas objects, uh, they seem to be uh, very promising candidates for global cluster progenitors. And if they are, this is what we should probably see. Um, and there are more, but I think I'll stop here. I'll thank you all for all your questions. You're more than welcome to ask more questions or in the Slack or now or. Dan will say if it's now on the slide, he rules. Um, but um, thank you very much for being so engaging. That made um, talking at night in my room while everyone else is asleep in the house um, really fun. So thank you all. We should uh, compile more questions that you have in the slide for Swidar. And uh, thanks so much again for, for your lectures this week. They were really great. And thank yeah. you all for coming. <laughs> all right. Good night, California. Oh. <laughs>